All right. Well, good morning. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I would imagine we'll have some folks uh, continue to join us, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Really grateful to have this opportunity uh, to hear from you and, and also uh, for our, our panel today to share their perspective. I think they bring a, a fantastic perspective of um, where we want to go, a little bit of where we've been over the last uh, last few months. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, things are not what they used to be. And it would be nice to get back to where we were with a, a strong economy, a growing economy. Uh, um, but there were some challenges even then, too, on, on labor shortages and so forth. Uh, but I am very anxious uh, to hear from our panel today, uh, given uh, the fact that where we are right now, <clears throat> obviously, we've We've had the COVID relief going back to last spring and moving forward. We don't know what the next uh, next step will be. Um, uh, Speaker Pelosi had some priorities that she was insisting on and, and would actually uh, reject anything uh, other than those priorities. And um, she has less leverage now in, in the House. So um, it, it's, it's going to be a, a different scenario, I think. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm fairly confident we can come up with something reasonable, uh, appropriate. Um, interestingly enough, you know, I heard from, uh, from an employer who, who was so appreciative of relief from last spring. And even though challenges still remain, uh, he, he told me that the relief um, doesn't need to continue in the same, uh, in the exact same form. Uh, so I, I hope that uh, we as elected officials can uh, really um, do what we need to do to get the targeted relief. So with that, uh, I certainly want to uh, thank our panelists here today. Today we have Leon Milabar. He's the Nebraska District Director of the Small Business Administration. Very, very integral part of the uh, PPP and <clears throat> relief last spring. Also joining us is Star Lale. She's the Economic Development Director for the City of Scotts Bluff. Uh, Star, uh, actually, we sat beside each other on City Council back in the day uh, on, on the Gearing City Council. Um, also, we have Oscar Gomez, the Assistant City Administrator for South Sioux City. And uh, really appreciate uh, all, all of you being on the, on the panel here today. And if... Uh, what, what we'll do is we'll have each panelist kind of give their perspective and, and insight and ideas, and then we'll uh, throw it open to two questions. So, uh, Leon, Mr. Milabar, would you like to begin? Thank you, Congressman. Uh, one of the things I like to tell everybody, uh, behind the scenes, things look pretty, uh, pretty good. One of the things we do is we follow up with all of our, our lenders. Uh, this last year was a record year for our agency and for the, uh, for the state. You know, at the end of the day, we did 58,936 loans for about $4.4 billion and all, all of that. And yes, we did a lot of uh, PPP loans and IDLE loans and IDLE loan program is still uh, open right now for uh, disasters. We have uh, 18 uh, disasters here in the United States that are were actively in addition to the um, the COVID-19 uh, uh, disaster. One of the interesting things behind the scenes that was our, is our traditional loan program. You know, we did $153.7 million in, in loans um, outside of the PPP and, uh, and IDLE. Interesting thing, when we drilled down to that, to that uh, over half of them were for companies that were looking to expand. And they took advantage of our 504 and, and 7A program. The other thing that we saw about 45% of them uh, businesses were the startups or businesses in transition. We're seeing quite a few uh, throughout the whole state, and especially outside the metropolitan area, where businesses are being sold to the next generation or a third party. And it, it's somewhat complicated if the, uh, the seller has a PPP loan, but we've, we've all figured that out. So we're still seeing that growth out, out there. The other thing is a very important that many years ago we did not have. We have this micro loan program. Uh, we did uh, only 107 uh, loans, uh, but for $1.8 million, our average loan for uh, micro businesses have gone up. 
my major concern is going forward, if I uh, looking at all of it, is um, we want to make sure as it, when it comes to economic development, we assist those businesses that are in transition from one generation to another. We do not want to lose the hardware store, the grocery store, um, uh, the various services that, 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 that we have. We want to be able to go ahead and move them. SBA is providing the financing. We do have money to go ahead and finance these, uh, these projects. I think uh, the lenders are telling us they have not seen uh, their only things they're concerned about is hotels, restaurants, and a few other businesses that uh, because of the, the COVID, the lockdowns and all that other stuff have, have, have had, had an impact. My other concern a major concern is those uh, businesses that have gone through this lockdown and all, all, all of that, that um, where business has not come back. And uh, one of the things I'm recommending that uh, for all economic jobs and chambers to reach out to their customers, their businesses out there and see who needs technical assistance. You know, that could be uh, the Nebraska Business Development Center because we have offices uh, all across the uh, uh, the state uh, could could be score. There is uh, uh, they need to do financials to see where they're at uh, and see what they need to go ahead and do different so to make sure they uh, survive. So there's money, there's technical assistance uh, out there. Um, th those that who are marginal businesses, they are my biggest concern. We lose a business, it's very hard to go ahead and get that back, and the cost of getting it back is is, is tremendous. Um, I'm always encouraged, uh, you know, and, and if you run into businesses on the other side who are looking at uh, business transition and all of that, Nebraska Business Development Center and, and Carney O'Neill yourself and Sarah do a wonderful job with that help, with that business transition. You need evaluation. Uh, we've had less problems with business transition, especially if SBA is involved with financing and lenders are involved, uh, involved with that because we can get an adequate picture of what the business is, is worth and or uh, if you're selling and or uh, purchasing in it, um, uh, I'll save uh, any additional uh, issues for uh, questions that, uh, that people may have. Uh, Congressman, is that is that enough for a, for an intro? Yeah, we'll we'll uh, likely have questions, and uh, so we'll we'll come back on that. Uh, uh, Star, would you like to go next? Yes. Um, good morning, everyone. I just want to talk about a few things that the city of Scotts Bluff has been doing as far as workforce development. Um, there's been um, a lot of changes here in uh, Western Nebraska as everywhere. But first of all, a shout out to Nebraska Business Development Center. I work really close with uh, Spencer Ryan. When people call me and uh, they don't know where to start on um, a business plan or financials or anything like that, I send them directly to Spencer at the Nebraska Business Development Center and our committee that um, makes our economic development loans is very comfortable with the way Spencer uh, puts together the package and he brings it to, to us or the, the company brings it to us and we know that it's fully vetted and that it's a, a, good, a good plan. So thank you to NBDC. That's just one of the partners that we work with here um, at the city of Scotts Bluff. Um, I had a local citizen actually bring me an idea um, I guess it's been about a year ago that South Dakota is doing, it's called the, their Build Dakota program. And she said, why can't we do this more on a local level and help our employers that are looking for the skilled workforce? Because that's still the number one issue out here in Western Nebraska. And I think across the state is a skilled workforce. So we put a committee together and we just started talking about how could we scale this down from a, st a state program down to more of a local program and how were we gonna, gonna get that funded? So we are calling our program uh, Together We Grow and um, it, we haven't launched it yet. We're very, very close to getting the funding actually through the city of Scotts Bluff. Um, we're gonna start with 250,000, but we think that is going to um, disappear rather quickly. Uh, what the money will be used for is the, um, the business will actually be the applicant. If they have an apprenticeship um, or an internship or something like that, or even a job to fill, and they hire someone that has you know, no training in that particular field, whether it's anything from a bank teller to um, an electrician, a plumber, anything like that, um, they can hire that person at maybe a a lower wage, maybe it's um, 
10 to $15, but that's not really a living wage. So our, what our program will do is help supplement that person's wage and get them up to maybe a um, 16 to $20 an hour uh, wage while they're learning and while they're an apprentice. And then after um, a few months and years, that person, that um, individual becomes um, more of a, an asset to that company and the company can actually afford to, to pay them that, that full wage. So we're working really closely with our businesses. We're working very closely with our community college, Western Nebraska Community College. We're going to try to get our area certified um, in the, uh, the career readiness program. The, all 11 counties in Western Nebraska are working on that. There is um, a certification test that they take. It's like $60, which again, our program would pay for to see what skills that particular person has and um, where they would fit within our workforce. One of the huge issues that we have right now in Western Nebraska is housing. We have very, very few houses on the market and the ones that are on the market um, are dated or dilapidated in some way. And so uh, we are going to apply through the state, through the um, workforce housing uh, grant program and we've also applied for an owner-occupied um, rehab program for 750,000. And we're hoping to know about that um, fairly soon. So we have a really a housing shortage right now and it's really hard to um, you know, build something or get a development going in a, a very short time. So part, and part of that problem has been, we have had a lot of people, if you're familiar with our area, we're about 200 miles from Denver. So a lot of the, the unrest and the things that are going over going on over in Colorado and in Denver, people have just had enough. And we're having a lot of people move in from the front range and from Colorado, not only as residents, but um, working with a couple of smaller manufacturing companies that are interested in moving over here as well. So um, just working really closely with not only NBC, NBDC, but WNCC, our college, uh, USDA Rural Development, there's so many tools out there, I think that businesses aren't aware of. And then also the Nebraska Department of Labor, they have a program for displaced workers. If someone you know, has been laid off from one job and they need to be retrained at another job, there's uh, funding out there from the Nebraska Department of Labor. So what's frustrating is trying to get that information out um, into our community and let them know about all of the resources that are out there. Um, another grassroots program that, that we started is um, called Community Connections. And that is for newcomers that move into the area, connecting them with either a uh, volunteer or civic organization somewhere where they can, they can volunteer and become a part of the community. Because a lot of times what happens is somebody moves here, they don't know anyone, they go from work to home, from work to home, and they say, oh, this, this isn't for me. So making that initial connection with newcomers and with that, that potential workforce, and then also having something for them to do. And I know it's, it's difficult in smaller communities. That's why we try to promote our entire region. So there might not be, able, be something going on right here in Scotts Bluff, but there might be something going on in one of our neighboring communities. Um, Baird is 20 miles away, Bridgeport's 30 miles. Um, you know, Mitchell's about six miles. So trying to, as far as tourism and things to do, trying to promote the entire region so that um, people, especially young families, have something to do and get out and, um, and take advantage of those things. So um, I can quit talking. I have a lot more stuff, but um, I'll let Oscar go ahead and visit. <laughs> Thank you, Star. I appreciate that. Uh, I, too, am a big fan of the Nebraska Business Development Center. I think they just do fantastic work. Um, so, uh, Mr. Gomez, Oscar, you want to take over now? Sure, sure. Thank you very much, Congressman. And uh, uh, just like Star, I think we're, we kind of have the sim kind of similar uh, issues in our community, so we can talk about some of the things that, that we are dealing with, uh, especially with this COVID. Uh, definitely hasn't been easy. Uh, our industrial um, district obviously has not been affected so much other than, you know, lowering the hours that they're working with. And obviously that affects their sales uh, budgets and all that stuff. But um, obviously the, the small 
business, um, new restaurants, uh, your small stores, uh, they're the ones that are being affected the most. So obviously working with the state, uh, Department of Labor, uh, DED to come up with some of the ideas how to help these people out because they are the ones that are suffering the most. Uh, and especially now that all of a sudden now we're back to 25% capacity. So that is uh, does definitely a, a struggle here in our community. Uh, workforce, obviously with those companies, uh, the major industries like Tyson, for example, uh, currently, they can probably hire 200 people uh, today if we if they want to, but at the same time, with the low um, unemployment rate that Siouxland, you know, our community has, you know, where are they going to get them from? Uh, right now, pretty much the big companies are fighting with each other, trying to get the employees into their facilities to work there. Uh, so that's becoming an issue where the Tysons, the Wells Blue Bunnies the seaborne sea uh, food uh, are competing with each other where they're just stealing uh, customers or employees at the, in, this, in this case. So we are talking with them as far as what we can do as a community to help them out. Uh, what are the one, what are the things that they're looking for? What kind of uh, jobs they have? Because obviously we can promote our community as far as what we have for housing, schools, um, you know, or jobs that, or the companies that we have in our communities, but we really don't know what kind of jobs they have within their industry. So it's always nice to talk with them and say, okay, so if we're looking for a specific uh, trade, what is it that you're looking for? Uh, do we need to get together with the schools, uh, colleges, and make sure that they are doing the trade jobs or having the, the tools to teach this um, people to work with you to make sure they stay in our community. So, so that's something that we are uh, dealing with in our, uh, in our community for the, um, for the workforce. One of the things that we started to do was to meet with the big industries and talk about, you know, uh, look, how are we going to, um, how are we going to uh, promote our community? Our community has great uh, jobs, has great housing, and uh, has a great school system, but how do we promote that outside of our community? So if somebody's looking at a new job, if they're not happy at their current job and they're looking to, to for, for a better job, and if they have to move their families, it's like, what are the things that they're gonna look at? Obviously housing is one of them, uh, the school system for the kids, uh, you know, how do we promote that? So we are talking with the Tysons and the ingredients and empiricals here in our town to make sure they let us know what they have to offer and why these people should pick them to work for. But as well, we have to co uh, promote our community to make sure that we have the right housing. We promote our, our school system, which I think our school system is great. And, uh, and we also do a better job of just not promoting parks, um, you know, uh, entertainment things that, yeah, those are great once you're here in town, but what's gonna get the people to come in here? Uh, our housing obviously has an issue, like Star was mentioning, that we have very low um, amount of houses that are for sale or in the market. If they do go in the market within a week, they're already sold. Uh, but they are houses that need a, a lot of money to put into it. And if you build a house, uh, you know, obviously that's going to cost a lot more than build, than buying a, a $200,000 home. So, so it is a it is an issue on that. So we are addressing that. We have contractors that are willing to, uh, to build homes, but, but they don't have the capital to do that. So we are working with, uh, uh, with DED, with the Nebraska Affordable Housing Trust Fund that, you know, and see if that's an avenue to, perhaps if we get some funding, uh, we can do the infrastructure for the contractor and then maybe they can build the houses without any need from, uh, any financial need from the, from the city. Uh, another issue that we see in our community, once we start talking about workforce, jobs, um, you know, attracting people into our community is uh, childcare. Uh, we don't have enough childcare to, uh, to meet the needs of the people that are working in this industries. Uh, some families are working in the morning, you know, uh, the wife is working in the morning, the husband is working at night, and they're doing that so that way they don't have to uh, have the expensive child uh, care expense. So that is something that we are looking into it. Uh, Dakota Connections here in our town uh, is a group of uh, nonprofit organizations that are 
taking that on and see how they can help the communities as far as getting another, um, you know, facilities for childcare or, um, or anything that the companies may need. So, so those are the things that, that we are seeing. So, so obviously it's uh, working with the state and some of the funding and avenues that, that they are out there. They're great to work with. And uh, so we appreciate the fact that they're willing to work with us, especially in these tight, tough times. So. Very good. Thank you, uh, Oscar, for your uh, perspective there. Um, those of you who would like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, you can uh, uh, just go into the system there and, and register your question and I will uh, read it to the group. Um, <clears throat> while you're doing that, let me just say that, you know, that this workforce issue is, um, of course, it was a, a challenge in another form uh, last winter, uh, even before COVID hit. Uh, now there, there's some new twist to it. And so it, it's very important for us to, to really, at the federal level, let me say, really get this unemployment thing right. Um, Speaker Pelosi, her, I think her highest priority is going back to the $600 a week uh, unemployment um, enhancement. I hear from employers all the time that that uh, can be very damaging to a local e economy, actually, in terms of what it does to the workforce um, and to the workplace. We have uh, supply chain issues uh, up and down the line. <clears throat> talk to car dealers who can't get enough inventory. I talk to appliance uh, stores, they can't get the inventory that they, that they could otherwise sell. Uh, so, and, and it all boils down to workforce. Housing shortages, that boils down to workforce issues as well. So um, I'm, I'm glad that uh, uh, you guys are working overtime to, to really get in there and and address the workforce challenges, the, the training that's needed and, and so forth. So, all right, uh, we have a <clears throat> couple questions here. The first one from Jill Ping uh, for Leon. Uh, Jill says she has a client that received a PPP loan, sole proprietor only, and then died about one month later. How does the estate handle the forgiveness application? Well, wow. okay, uh, Leon, you wanna take that? Okay, I've got it. Uh, one of the things I suggest that the estate go ahead and call our, our, our office. Uh, you know, we get into a whole variety of details. They're gonna end up having a file as any estate. I, I've been executor of a, of a number of estates and all, all of that. They still need to go ahead and file a file on a timely basis too with the, with the lender. Uh, whoever the accountant, whoever is the administrator of a state needs to go ahead and uh, one, first contact the bank and let them know uh, the financial institution that this has uh, happened. And then we can walk them through the rest of the process that needs to be, uh, to be uh, uh, take place. The state will, uh, will, uh, will file um, and uh, uh, basically whatever records that they, uh, uh, the sole proprietor have, that will use those to um, uh, get them released from the loan and all, all of that. So yeah, we, we've had a number of those situations that, that have happened as in business transition. But you know, don't be afraid to call our office, 402-221-4691. We've seen everything under the, uh, uh, that possibly could happen, uh, uh, has happened. So, um, so much of what we, what we see uh, is uh, so individual and there's other things that we may not be able to co uh, cover on in this uh, conversation, but we can ha handle that. That's not a bad uh, thing. Uh, that in, it's not insurmountable. We can take care of that for you. That, uh, and again, Leon, um, you want to give it just kind of an update on the overall forgiveness issue in, in general? Well, uh, uh, yeah, yes. One of the things we're still waiting for, uh, first of all, our, our lenders are taking um, uh, the application for forgiveness. There's a uh, number of different applications. If you go on to sba.gov, uh, COVID-19, there are uh, they there are outlines on uh, forms. If you're sole proprietorship, do not have a lot of uh, employees. There's an easy form, so to speak. There's another uh, uh, 
uh, form also that they were uh, that they're using and were invent that uh, you do have employees. Um, but uh, for loans generally under 150,000, we're seeing some individuals have already uh, have already uh, uh, applied with their financial institution to get their uh, the loan everything released and all all, all, of, all of that. Uh, I suggest uh, as a you know, I've worked with a few CPAs out in the Scottsbluff area, uh, and uh, we've talked about that because I've talked across the state. Um, go ahead and apply. Get everything ready. My only concern, and there's been a, a little bit of a holdback, we were waiting to see if Congress was going to go ahead and change the rules and do a total forgiveness on the uh, in the event that somebody got an idle loan for $1,000 or $10,000. So we were looking for possibly some of those changes and all of that. But some of the financial institutions or businesses being sold or uh, there's been other, some other uh, significant change. So uh, we'll take calls. We'll take calls from businesses, the accountants, and and the bankers. Uh, that's one of the things we we do. We're very good at taking phone calls and getting those uh, questions answered for you. You bet. Thank you. Uh, we had another question from Sean uh, in terms of how many attendees on the line today versus yesterday. The numbers vary a little bit throughout the the program, uh, but uh, or throughout the time. But we uh, in the 20s, uh, we've had uh, consistently. Um, so appreciate your participation, uh, certainly. Um, other questions, feel free to weigh in there. Certainly, uh, we want to encourage uh, anyone to ask questions if you want more information. And, and um, I, I do want to touch, uh, elaborate a little bit more on on the workforce issue, um, we uh, had a hearing uh, in the House a while back uh, that uh, focused on transitioning uh, folks uh, actually from when they were incarcerated <clears throat> into the workforce. And uh, actually though, like for example, the Arizona home builders actually went into the Arizona prison system and started training the prisoners while in prison so that they could be prepared uh, for the workforce uh, uh, upon leaving uh, the prison. And we actually heard from a participant. It was, I mean, it was really a, a fantastic perspective that he shared about uh, how he went through the, the training to be an electrician, uh, became that electrician, uh, got a job less than a week upon release from prison <clears throat> and immediately began seeing an increase in, in wages. I think he started at like $13 an hour and then uh, quickly climbed into the 20s. Um, just a fantastic story. And then he, he also shared, you know, not just the, about the paycheck, but what it means, you know, what that dignity of work means and, and uh, providing for his family and being involved in the community and just uh, so many different things that uh, that are uh, that are so important and are an integral part of of why uh, we we structure uh, work the way we do and and the value of work and and what that uh, what that means. Um, any any questions? Adrian, I, I just, if you don't yeah, mind, I was just gonna. Um, I forgot. I've got all these notes here, but um, both of our high schools in Scottsbluff and Gearing um, have career academies. Um, Gearing's in their second year and Scottsbluff's been at it for maybe four years now, but um, that is another great resource for um, mm -hmm. to get kids into apprenticeships and um, get them into to working with some of the local businesses. There's a lot of great partnerships here in Scottsbluff and Gearing where um, high school kids are actually working in some of our businesses and again go to them you know let the the high both the high schools and the community colleges know what the need is in those high wage jobs the 
there's a need for plumbers, there's a need for electricians, carpet layers, you know, all of those um, jobs that pay really well. Yeah, they might start out at $13 an hour. And, you know, again, your example ending up at $20 an hour, that's where our grassroots program could help um, pay that difference. Maybe they started at 15, you know, we could pay that, um, that difference in their, their hourly wage for a while until they are, uh, go through the certification for, to become a, a certified electrician. And then also the Department of Labor has the certified apprenticeship programs. We have two businesses here in the Scottsville Fearing area that have um, become certified. And we have a couple of others that are going through that now. So there's a lot of resources out there. Um, another, again, um, thing that we did here in Scotts Bluff, we had a facade improvement program for the Southeast part of our community. Um, the city has put in about 100 and, excuse me, 253,000 into that program. It's a matching grant program. Um, it was up to $10,000. It really helped um, that corridor of our community. So we're now opening it up to the entire uh, community in our blighted and substandard area um, to apply for grants to help um, improve the facade or the outside of their, their business. So, and a lot of these will be small businesses that, are, that apply, maybe a new coat of paint, a new, um, just fixing up their facade and making them look more appealing, I think will really also help um, the local businesses. But we've seen a lot of innovation through this COVID on, you know, especially the restaurants, delivery, pickup, you know, coffee shops, all of those kind of things. A lot of the smaller businesses on Main Street have gone online and now are selling selling their um, their things online um, that that weren't before. Um, so there's been a lot of innovation out there. Right. Well, I I think it's fair to say that uh, downtown Scotts Bluff is alive and well and very vibrant and uh, a lot of a lot of choices for for uh, customers. So let's go to our uh, next question here from uh, Dawson Brunswick. What does the funding look like for those programs? Is it mainly local businesses funding it to further develop uh, the future workforce, uh, school funds, um, and then some secret state and federal funding? I don't know how about how secret that might be, but uh, from my perspective, there's going to be a combination of, uh, of funds. Um, would any of you want to uh, elaborate on that? Um, with our program, we're starting with local funds, um, 250000 from the city of Scotts Bluff. And eventually, you know, we're looking at applying for funds to keep the program going, including our economic development fund. Um, just kind of kind of put it out there and see how it how it works. And once we've kind of proven that the program works, then um, we're hoping for buy-in from um, the employers in the area. All right. Anyone else want to add to that? On, on our end, I, I think we're just doing the same thing, which is just the local funding from the city or the what we call the community development agency, which is our economic development arm of the city. And then we're reaching out to the companies to uh, you know, to make sure they let us know what they need. So that way we can go to the state and say, here's what the issues are. And then they tell us what the avenues that we can take. So that makes it easier for us to make sure that we nail down what they need and then go after those funds. Right, very good. <clears throat> Another question here, mentioning that both uh, Oscar and Star talked about partnerships and then asking what kind of advice on forming regional partnerships would you have in the promotion of jobs, tourism, economic development opportunities and so forth? Uh, I, can, I can start on that. Um, some of the partnerships that we're doing, um, obviously um, if, for those who are on the, on the Sioux meeting, if you don't know Lance at West, he's one of the guys that thinks outside the box. So he's always thinking of what's out there, what can we do better? Than what we're doing now so uh so one of the things that we're doing we're partnering up with uh local tv station so tv station pretty much has all the uh, they can reach out to multiple communities uh so for example uh this tv station can just say well there's an industry that closed 
in the Midwest, they can target the city and just uh, shoot a bunch of uh, ads to uh, social media, TV ads, radio stations, things like that, that, you know, obviously social media is huge on what they do. If uh, somebody's looking for a job, uh, they'll see, uh, they'll see our advertising saying, why South Sioux is a great place to move to. And once they click on that, obviously they'll see all of our, all of our companies that are needing people to work and as well as having a promotional uh, piece for the school system, because that is, uh, that is obviously a huge piece in our community. So, so we are partnered with people that actually have the tools to reach out to other communities uh, and, uh, and obviously have the industries or the school tell their side of the story of why they are such a great place to work for or why their kids should be in our community schools. Okay. Um, yeah. To me, um, economic development has always been about relationships. So forming those relationships are, um, are very crucial, um, not only from uh, service, the service provider area, you've got that, that network, but you also have to have, reach out to the community and have those relationships with your business community so that they feel comfortable coming to you if they have some type of an issue and that, that way you're aware and it doesn't catch you off guard. Um, also, the relationship with the school district is, is huge. So um, forming those relationships and just checking in with everyone once in a while um, really does not, does not hurt at all. And you know, if, there's, if you've got an issue going on in, in your community, um, chances are someone in Nebraska, someone across the state has dealt with it before. So I guess not, don't ever be afraid to reach out and ask your peers for, um, for advice on different issues. So you're not out there spinning your wheels and trying to invent the, invent the excuse me, reinvent the wheel um, that there's a lot of help out there from uh, service organizations, um, business development center, again, the rural enterprise assistance project. Um, there's, there is just all kinds of help out there. And our area, this is another um, thing that we're doing with the college, with WNCC, and also the Rural Enterprise Assistance Project is we have a, about a 20% Hispanic population here in our area. And I really feel that, um, we're, that we're, we're missing an opportunity there for some entrepreneurship with, with our young um, Hispanic um, and Hispanics. And so we're going to have um, a leadership development series for um, Hispanics in our community so they're aware of how to start a business, how to write a business plan, and um, those types of things. I just think that that we're missing the boat and we have for many, many years. I've lived here all my life, my life and I just don't think that outreach has been very strong. So um, that is one of my huge goals. <laughs> very good, very good. Um, <clears throat> Oscar and Star, can you speak to uh, perhaps, you know, the inquiries to your offices, have they changed uh, because of COVID? Are, are you, uh, have you seen any surprise um, inquiries or something that you just didn't expect? And can, can you speak to a, a little bit of what, what that looks like given COVID? Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Oscar. Okay, yeah. Um, well, the, obviously the inquiries are still there as far as um, them opening up a new business or expansions, but the, the kind of the not knowing when to do it or whether to do it, I think is where it scares the, the business owners. So if uh, somebody comes in and wants to do a new business here in town, they inquire everything they have to do, but once they get to the point that they have to pull the trigger, they kind of hold back until things kind of settle down. Uh, whatever that's going to be in the future. Uh, but also they, they always hear about CARES uh, Act and there's funding available for businesses. So the, the education piece becomes such a, such a big uh, piece of this because if people don't understand what that money is or who can apply for it or how it works, it, uh, it puts it on us to make sure that we understand what kind of funding it is and who can apply for that. So, so we've seen that inquiries are there, but at the same time, they're thinking there's just money out there to be, to get and anyone can get it, which at that time is not, 
not the case in most of the times. I guess I've been really surprised and Leon um, touched on it just briefly in his intro. There's a lot of expansion going on with local businesses. They're, they're seeing the need to expand their businesses, everything from service businesses to manufacturers. And so that has been a really bright spot. I mean, we um, closed our city office um, starting on the 17th of uh, March and didn't come back until June. Well, I had my laptop at home and I actually worked, seemed like I worked more hours from home than I did at the office because I could never shut it off. And um, with us being in the mountain time zone, the time difference, people calling and those types of things, um, it's just, it's been phenomenal here in Western Nebraska that it just hasn't stopped. Our projects just haven't stopped. They've just continued. And again, um, a lot of expansions are happening. Um, a, a few new businesses, but again, um, the importance of the business retention and expansion visits to your um, businesses. Sometimes now you can't do them in person, but maybe over the phone or some type of a Zoom, Zoom conference. Again, keeping, keeping in touch with those businesses is just vital. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Um, Leon, if you could comment just briefly on on workforce issues from your perspective, is there anything that you think needs to be done or could be done to, to address uh, workforce issues? Or what, what do you see uh, with, with your clientele uh, relating to workforce issues that uh, the, the rest of us uh, could benefit from? Well, uh, you know, I, I think we covered it fairly well, but one of the things that we're seeing uh, regarding workforce issues, uh, there, there's certain sectors, uh, as uh, people in the construction industry told me um, across the state, and uh, we stay pretty close to the construction industry because we've seen so much uh, growth in there. Uh, in a 504 loan program, uh, there's an extra $10 million in new projects went out, out this year. Uh, in addition, uh, over and above what we would normally see, so we had about $36 million. Um, if you got a warm, if you're a warm body and your heart beats and all of that, uh, and you have construction, uh, any of those skills, you can get hired here to, because you know we see the change in the. In the uh, there's just such a, a demand. I, uh, basically, one of the things we've been telling uh, individuals, you've got to start an apprenticeship uh, uh, program and bring people uh, in. Uh, that is. That's going to be the new new model. And um, uh, the quote a friend of mine who's a former chamber president in Lincoln is says, um, you, get, you have to reach out to the other uh, minority community and bring them in. Uh, there's an opportunity. Uh, what we're seeing, uh, I have to have, uh, I'm going to step back a little, a little bit. I suggest you uh, talk, uh, speaking with, uh, what is it, uh, Griselda Rendon in, in uh, Grand Island. They've done a tremendous job of uh, when it comes to the skilled labor and getting businesses certified, you know, whether it's electricians, carpenters, you know, um, they're running a number of, uh, of programs helping people uh, start businesses. Uh, workforce development is a, a very big problem. That is why this retention and growth is so important. Call the businesses, reach out to them, so we don't lose what we have right uh, right now. Uh, I, other than that, I have not seen any other magic bullet. I, I'm so much concerned about retaining what we have and not losing it, and those businesses not um, not uh, closing. That's where we're getting uh, we're we're getting the the calls right right now. Um, and here's the other thing: if you're hearing about somebody, anybody who's going business is going to close, hopefully they're doing some type of a uh, the areas doing some type of labor uh, reemployment uh, uh, programs so uh, they can find these individuals jobs uh, uh, quickly so they don't move out of the area and all of that and don't go on un unemployment and all of that. You know, most of Raskins I know, we would all prefer to work rather than be on un unemployment. So uh, other than that, I have not seen any, uh, major, any uh, magic bullets, uh, uh, so, so to speak. Mm -hmm. All right, let's see. We have another question here uh, or a comment uh, 
from Sean Kasky. Uh, his colleague Sandra Barrera is great at engaging the Hispanic business community with a, a link there. Just gave a presentation on the topic, a, a recorded presentation in a multi-state conference. Uh, so you can let Sean know, Sean Kasky know, uh, uh, if, uh, if you'd like more information there. So appreciate that, Sean. Again, that was Sandra Barrera, B-A-R-R-E-R-A, -R -R -E -R -A, uh, for any of you who want to take that down. And then uh, Sean uh, can uh, also get you more information uh, as well. I appreciate that. You know, it's, it's interesting as, as we are trying to deal with the issues at, at the federal level, um, you, you take personal protective equipment, uh, obviously an, a, a hugely important uh, item uh, throughout all of COVID. You know, it, it, um, it didn't happen overnight, but basically all the manufacturing of that equipment found its way to China. And, um, and I will say that, you know, with all that being manufactured in China, China doesn't even have to act maliciously for that to be a problem during a worldwide pandemic. And so I, I'm hoping that we can be poised across our country uh, to be able to uh, bring a lot of that back. And, and I think we've got better trade policy now uh, than we had two or three years ago. Uh, I think that, um, you know, we, we should have an available workforce, hopefully, that, you know, they'll, they'll, there will be some transition from uh, some uh, previous industries uh, pre-COVID uh, to, to what I see as opportunities moving forward. That's why I, I want to reiterate that we, we better get the uh, unemployment policy right uh, for the workforce uh, moving forward. Uh, but I think that coupled with technology and innovation uh, can enable entrepreneurs across America to provide, for example, uh, the PPE uh, for an affordable amount. And with, with automation and available labor, uh, we, we can be very competitive on uh, the cost of the output that uh, China has previously uh, you know, that's I mean, the, the, the cost of, of labor over there is what is what drew so much of the manufacturing uh, to to China. Um, but things are different now. And I think uh, value is placed on on other other issues uh, rather than just the bare minimum cost. And so uh, we want to make sure that we, we get our tax policy right to uh, being on the Ways and Means Committee and handling tax policy, international trade policy, and, and a lot of workforce issues. Uh, I think we can, we can get some things done. Uh, the likely chairman uh, of the Ways and Means Committee will continue to, uh, more than likely continue to be Richie Neal, a uh, Democrat from uh, Massachusetts. He's good to work with. Uh, I, I, uh, I think he is someone who, who wants to get to yes uh, on various things. We are going to look at uh, family savings issues, I believe. Uh, that's a, a major issue uh, ac across America. Of what can we do to get families, households, individuals to think more about their financial future? That touches so many parts of our economy and begins with work for workforce, once again, <laughs> fairly basic. So I, I'm uh, encouraged to hear uh, some of the uh, positive things we've, we've heard here this morning. Uh, that um, that you guys are, are working on. And I know, uh, obviously, with the wide expanse of the third district, uh, we couldn't have a, a panelist from every county on the, on the line here this morning, but I know a lot of great things are, are happening. Uh, so uh, certainly encourage any of you to, uh, to share what you uh, observe, uh, whether it's in your own community or, or uh, wherever you might be, or whatever you have observed el elsewhere. Uh, please, uh, please let us know. So I uh, really appreciate uh, once again, our panelists, uh, Leon, Starr and Oscar, thank you for uh, what you do. I know you've been busy and so much has been happening. I know, Starr, you mentioned how <clears throat> you've still got a lot of work done from home. That's a new dynamic across the workforce as well. And so uh, 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 we as policymakers uh, will need to need to acknowledge that. And, and I think above all, be flexible 
with, with what uh, our policies are and understanding that in order to encourage innovation and creativity, uh, there needs to be flexibility. So, uh, and again, thank you to uh, all of our participants here today for uh, engaging and we uh, look forward to uh, keeping in touch. If you do have questions or, or uh, comments uh, that you uh, need to bring to our attention, please feel free to do so. I, on the line here today is Jared from the Grand Island office. Many of you uh, know Jared from uh, uh, his work out and around the district. And then also uh, Josh Jackson is uh, on the line as, as well. He's uh, my deputy chief of staff out of the Washington office. And so, a lot is happening. It'll be an interesting uh, next few months, uh, but I, I really believe that there is a, an anxiousness and in communities all across America uh, to really grow our economy, get folks back to work, uh, innovate in, in ways uh, that we, we never imagined before. But uh, as we know, necessity is the mother of invention, as the old saying goes. And that, that can bring about some very good things. I, I wouldn't wish for our country to be in this situation right now with COVID, but I do think we, there's a lot that we can take away from it, whether it's uh, innovation in the healthcare sector, uh, whether it's uh, creativity and, and expansion in the, in the business sector. Who would have thought that there would be record RV sales uh, uh, with, with uh, part of our economy being shut down? And, and yet that has, that's just one example of, of, of others that, um, that are out there that have, have uh, some unintended or, or kind of some surprise impacts uh, from folks uh, just living life differently than, than they did before COVID. So again, feel free to let us know if you have questions or concerns or want more information. Uh, just my uh, uh, website for my uh, official office is adriansmith.house.gov. Let us know uh, how we can be helpful. And so we, we want to get folks back to work because uh, that's, that's how you shape a better future. And that's how communities become stronger in our, in our country as a whole uh, as well. So thanks again to all of our panelists and our attendees. And uh, please keep in touch and hopefully we'll be able to meet in person one day soon. So thanks again and take care. <laughs>